everyone. Welcome to Better Tech. Before we get into the topic for today, which is around smart cities and sustainable communities, let's have a quick introduction about yourself and what you do so that our audience is familiar. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Amna, for the opportunity to um, speak with you today. I look forward to our conversation on smart cities and sustainable communities. My name is yeah. Kumal Anand, and I am a professional in the digital technology space. I've spent uh, the recent part of my career working with a mission-based and purpose-driven organizations um, to lead both digital transformations and technology operations. I am a proud father of three young and energetic and fun uh, kids. Um, and I'm really interested in how communities, organizations, cities can leverage and harness the benefits of technology um, to improve the experience of, of their inhabitants, of their stakeholders, of the people that they interact with. Right. That's pretty much what our discussion today is going to be around. So we've seen a lot of technology trends pick up over the last few years and like 2020 aside, which trend do you think has the most potential and why? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And uh, I think that question in itself could take up this entire podcast, but for the sake of, for the sake of time, I'd like to focus on not necessarily um, one or two trends from the technology perspective, but talk about this confluence of trends. We have technology, innovation, invention, um, and advancements happening at such a rapid um, and expanded space, pace at, in our world today. And um, in the relation or context of smart cities and smart communities, there mm -hmm. is an exciting confluence between several key technologies, such as the expansion of cloud storage, um, robust cellular networks like 5, 5G, decreasing costs to launch and operate satellites that are going to revolutionize and, and transform our ability to um, access data um, and interact with this data, leverage this data and information from, you know, a single person holding a cell, a cell phone through to a, a satellite that's able to connect and provide mm -hmm. um, significant spatial coverage. That particular confluence of technologies will allow us to accelerate a lot of that, I think, hopes and dreams and visions that we have for, for sustainable communities and, and smart cities. And as simple as it sounds, right, the word smart city, but everyone has their own definition of what it looks like and what it actually is. So how do you define a smart city? Like what are the main pillars that you would say you, you know constitute a smart city? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question. And thank you for asking. In order to define a smart city, at least for the for the, the for the conversation today, I, I, I wanted to take a step back and look at city because you know it's one of those terms that we assume a, a meaning of, and I, I think it's important to sort of establish the terminology for city. And yeah. when we consider a city, you know, we all have sort of we can picture a city, a New York City, right? We can picture a city, or you know. Or Paris or, or Hong Kong, um, but looking at a city from sort of the, the basic elements, um, we have a, a, a location uh, which is a densely populated sort of geographic location with established boundaries and a, and a degree of permanence. The city itself is also sort of mandated to provide local services, um, governance, uh, social, social services, waste and water management, um, security, health. And so what we have is, you know, a geographic location, a certain amount of people that has a authority to deliver experiences and, and services and governance to that, to that body of people. So defining a city, um, that's where we're starting off with. And then let's talk about what it means to be smart, right? And so in our, our current our contemporary times, what we're looking at for a city to be smart is to a city that leverages technology across all the sort of different services um, and functions 
um, such as um, public health, such as um, waste and, and water management, uh, such as climate change risk mitigation, such as tourism to improve um, the experience as well as to manage those, those services more efficiently and with more, more access to data to help drive future uh, strategy and, and future improvements as well. And with all of these areas that you've just mentioned, where do smart cities and sustainable communities seek to achieve? I think, yeah, that, that's a, a question that can be explored many different ways um, based on, on the city, um, based on a community. I think in a general sense, what smart cities and sustainable communities are attempting to do is harness technology, but with a strong return on investment to improve the experience of their inhabitants, right? Different um, locations, different cities, different communities can have different priorities. Um, we talked through some of them, you know, um, we can talk about how transportation, you know, managing public um, transportation as, you know, a subway system, as mm -hmm. your traffic yeah. system, as, you know, once we start, you know, who knows when exactly this is going to occur, but once we have a proliferation of um, smart vehicles, you know, self-driving cars, you know, perhaps even, you know, freight tractor trailers as well, um, that's going to add another element to this transportation piece, but leveraging the technology through sensors, through computing power, through telecommunications to help better manage, meaning to better utilize the resources at the city's disposal um, mm -hmm. to make that management more efficient as well as to enhance the ability or delivery of that particular function. And so that can be spread across you know, public transportation. We talked a little bit about waste and water management. Energy management is a critical piece that I think Cities are attempting to use smart um, technology, smart methodologies to better manage. You know, it's an incredibly complicated process of power generation, power transmission, power distribution, power consumption. Obviously, the impact, the climate change impact, is a, is a key driver there. And so, anything that a, a city can utilize and leverage to better manage its energy resources, better manage energy consumption, both um, to ensure a better cost for, for all the stakeholders involved in the supply mm -hmm. chain, uh, but also to ensure that we're not wasting the energy, that we're not unnecessarily um, producing more strain in relation to, to climate change. Um, and we have other examples where, you know, tourism is a big uh, as a, a major priority um, for uh, the sustainability of a city. And so leveraging technology to improve the tourist experience, also to leverage technology to enable or enhance the capability of businesses and um, within a city to deliver better tourism um, experience uh, is, yep. um, is very important. So I think it's looking at from a city's priorities in terms of, you know, what they need to do to enhance their uh, specific area or function or service, and then taking the available um, technology um, and applying it with the right sort of strategy and right type of investment uh, to deliver that and make it real. And just picking up on that, uh, you know, harnessing the power of technology for better utilization of resources. Do you think that with all the unknown 2020 has brought us, we are making more progress towards building smart cities than we were before? Or are we actually have, do have we actually taken a step back from it? This is a, uh, I think, a, a question that uh, will take uh, a couple of years to to. To actually see the effects of where we're going? <laughs> yes, to fully understand. Yeah. I think it's we're in such a uh, unknown um, right now. We're, we're still in COVID, unfortunately. And uh, I think the ramifications, the consequences um, may not be fully realized or, or felt for, for years to come. But I, I do think there are some, definitely some, some points worth discussing here related to that. Uh, 
I th- for for I think one thing that we it's safe to assume is that COVID, unfortunately, um, suspended you know initiatives, um, projects, implementations, uh, many many different endeavors, including smart city initiatives as as well as sustainable community initiatives. Um, obviously, the uncertainty of COVID led to that, contributed to that. We also know that. You know, cities, let's consider the U.S. Um, for this conversation. There was a migration or, uh, uh, of inhabitants from cities into the surrounding um, area um, because of the risk involved with um, remaining in, in a city um, during the, the onset of the um, pandemic. In addition, the economic impacts of COVID um, are felt intensely in cities and thus contributing to um, inhabitants um, leaving the city or going moving to perhaps other other cities that may offer you know a lower cost of living or uh, may offer um, more space in terms of you know physical space and and so as this sort of volatility is happening as a result I think that the initiatives uh, might have slowed down or just suspended entirely because of that mm-hmm. sort of transition. But I do think that although the pandemic may have had a negative consequence on the actual implementation of initiatives and perhaps even the um, investment into initiatives um, because of the, the unfortunate um, economic toll uh, of the pandemic, I do sense that the COVID pandemic has actually elevated the importance of technology um, to both a business continuity, to both operational continuity for, for a city. Uh, we've seen um, how technology has enabled, you know, many companies to um, go work remote, um, to be able to sustain operations, to sustain a bit the business by the leverage and use of technology. And sort of that and that same lesson can be reinforced and applied to cities as now they look toward a future that mm-hmm. may have more larger scale risks that they need to manage and protect against and by leveraging technology to ensure or protect against some of the, the consequences from these events, and we're better positioned to maintain operational capability, better position to main, maintain business continuity, better position to weather the economic shocks or consequences of um, these type of events. You know, the COVID pandemic is one event um, that, you know, could impact a, a city. We've seen wildfires, we've seen massive power outages, we've seen climate change events. Um, and so, you know, by leveraging technology to, uh, better plan, um, to better anticipate, to better respond to these events, both from the operational perspective, but also from the inhabitants, right? If we have a a system in place that enables uh, quicker communication, more informed communication with inhabitants around a public health issue, um, it allows for tracking of, you know, particular trends and and, and health indicators and metrics um, and mm-hmm. allows for, you know, a quicker sort of, you know, path from, you know, initial symptoms to, you know, getting the proper treatment, allowing for, you know, a quicker vaccination process and protocol um, through the harnessing of technology, then the cities are enhancing um, their ability to um, provide a core service of security to the inhabitants, but they're also putting in place um, infrastructure to help weather um, the negative impacts of, of a pandemic or another um, consequential uh, event. So like all of these things that you've just mentioned, they, they have a lot of actors involved, right? It's not just the companies. So how do you think like companies and external stakeholders need to reorient their strategies to facilitate this shift that we're talking about, a move towards more of a sustainable community, more of a smart city? Yeah, this is a question that um, I actually struggled with 
because it's so multifaceted and complex. But you're right in terms of you know mentioning the uh, myriad of stakeholders, um, including companies and in, in the private sector, in yeah. in driving innovation and, and supporting and collaborating with with cities and communities to plan and deploy um, smart initiatives. I think one of the the opportunities here, and companies have already, you know, been engaged and have done fantastic things with with cities and communities across the world in terms of enabling and deploying smart technology um, and and smart initiatives. And so, mm-hmm. you know, there's a there's a large body of work that the and and experience that these companies can continue delivering and approaching. Um, but I think. As we move in the next few years in terms of, you know, learning more about what the effects um, of COVID are on, on cities and, and urban areas and communities as we're, as we're learning about opportunities where, you know, perhaps we, you know, can identify areas where, you know, we can a- address some of the, some of the gaps um, or some of the opportunities as a result of COVID. I think having strong partnerships and collaboration between companies and the policy leaders, the government, the, the governing leaders uh, of a city is, is critical to make sure that the technology itself is positioned for, for a, a city or community to actually implement and actually get value for based on the investment that's required. We won't be able, we want to be able to take advantage of this technology. We want to be able to deploy it reasonably quickly, reasonably cost effectively, if you will. And so that's going to require a real partnership between the companies that are developing this technology um, and the cities and communities that seek to deploy this technology with a real firm partnership and communication and collaboration, um, this type of acceleration in, in smart um, technology and smart initiatives, um, mm-hmm. I think, can occur. It's also going to be important, right, for for companies to understand um, how you know different cities, right, in New York City versus a smaller city, the resources available to f- the financial resources, the um, people, the human resources available to deliver and operate this technology is going to be different. So understanding that different models and, and different, yeah, different models or different uh, uh, technology um, may need to be deployed depending on the available sort of resources and need um, at various cities with the mm-hmm. objective um, achieving the same outcome, right? You know, whether it's energy management, whether it's waste and water management. Yeah, that makes sense. Where do you think new technologies like 5G fall into all of this? Yeah, five technologies like 5G are, I think, an exciting advancement in, in telecommunications and technology because it offers cities and communities a chance to scale their um, smart initiatives um, rather mm-hmm. inexpensively, right? Everyone, everyone has at least one cell phone these days, right? And now with, you know, the advance in um, IoT, um, the Internet of Things, uh, advancement of, you know, devices and sensors that are able to collect and, and share data from various locations and services, this te- you know, technology of 5G allows these devices to communicate quicker, allows them to share more information. And so what we're doing is we're sort of multiplying or expanding this digital box of this, this digital capability where we can gain access to more data. We can gain access to it quicker. Or we can work with it quicker so that, you know, we can, we can get more of the technology out and actually get it more, broadly used and utilized as well as collect more information that will allow us to hopefully make the decisions to make this particular, you know, these technologies more mm-hmm. efficient uh, and allow us to hopefully make sort of more 
informed or better informed decisions as they relate to different functions um, to city to city governance or city management. Right. So we're nearly at the end of our podcast. And the last question I have for you today is how do you think societies will look five to 10 years from now? That's a, that's a tough question. You know, COVID pandemic is central to a lot of the, the a lot of the questions that we, uh, a lot of this podcast. But it it, it, yeah. it has introduced uncertainty in terms of where what the what the what the world is going to look like. You know, even even three years from now. And um, and, yeah. and that's something like that's like a double edged sword, right? It's both like something exciting because you never know um, how innovative we could, you know, as a society be, but then it's also quite scary because we don't know, right? We're in the middle of all this uncertainty. Exactly. Exactly. And it is, and I think you see that in, in terms of, you know, how the, how, you know, the world or, you know, certain communities are responding um, to what the next year or two years look like. You know, there are some areas that are responding where it's going to very optimistically, like we're going to have this surge in innovation, this surge in economic output, the surge in mm-hmm. you know, everyone getting back out of quarantine and back into living life as we as we used to pre-pandemic. And then um, there's certain areas or that are you know, more a little bit more conservative in in the way they look in terms of the outlook of where we are going to be in a couple of years. Um, and because, and that basically I think underscores the uncertainty that you mentioned um, in terms of this, this double-edged sword, right? It, it can kind of still kind of go both ways and we, we're, yeah. we're living on that, that, that edge. But so I'm not quite sure if I have uh, um, the insight into where we're going to be in five to 10 years, but this is what I would like to see. I would love to see, you know, as we as we mentioned before, that COVID I think has elevated the need for technology across basically everything we do, right? From enabling students, right, and literally kindergarten through high school and college to learn remotely, right? From mm-hmm. from organizations and companies to operate remotely, um, for our supply chain, our global supply chain to you know, leverage more in technology to become a more automated and more efficient so that when we have critical need to move vaccinations or the move medical supplies, we can do that uh, even though we may more of the workforce or may the may be remote. They may allow, you know, cities to implement, you know, services and technology to better inform um, and provide guidance to its inhabitants on what to do during a health pandemic, and then mm-hmm. how to interact with health professionals and health services to ensure that, you know, as quickly um, and efficiently as possible, we can make sure that we are treating and caring for the inhabitants um, to prevent, you know, situations where it, the problem becomes too large or the to manage. So, you know, these are all particular areas that I think are definitely real potential uh, for the future because, you know, as a result of COVID, this is going to galvanize, hopefully galvanize our leaders in the private sector and public sector and our civil society to come together and, and realize the benefit of harnessing the smart um, technologies to provide this elevated capability and capacity for, for cities. I'd mm-hmm. also like to see, you know, a, a framework, a national framework, let's say for here in the U.S., a, a national framework for what a smart city and sustainable communities maturity could look like, right? Establishing, because you the question you asked, what does a smart city look like? Yeah. And, you know, that, you know, can vary based on, you know, a lot of different variables and, and characteristics of the particular city we're talking about. But I think it would be fantastic where if we had, you know, a maturity framework that said, okay, if you want to become level one in terms of a smart city, this is what we need to do. Um, and then work your way up until, you know, we sort of get to the pinnacle of um, a smart city sort of capability. Um, I would also, and this is something that's very important, just a Across where we are in terms of t- technology and in general, but um, there needs to be a real concerted, um, and there is 
Um, but it, we shouldn't lose sight of the importance of cybersecurity and we shouldn't lose sight of the importance of data privacy as we, you know, um, rely more on technology, as we rely more on um, connected devices, interconnected devices. You know, cybersecurity is a real, is a real um, uh, risk area if not done yes. um, properly. And, you know, the more that we have connected and means, you know, the more that can be potentially exposed and, and taken advantage of. So this is going to be, I think, a critical area that we continue to innovate and invest in. And the same thing from, from data privacy. We know around the world that um, data protection and privacy um, regulations are increasingly becoming, are increasing um, importance um, from a sort of a protection of the individual, the citizen, um, and their information, right? We have HIPAA here and for medical information. We have GDPR and the European Union for Data um, Protection. And, and so I think what we're going to see is more of this um, type of sort of protection for the individual to ensure that, you know, their, their data is being used responsibly and gets consent before, you know, actual use. And so as we connect more of our devices and we rely more on information that's coming from, you know, um, my cell phone, your cell phone, for more of the devices that collect information about, you know, how we, we live and how we, how we work and how we interact it's really going to be very important that we also maintain protection of that data to ensure that um, we maintain trust with um, with uh, um, inhabitants, with the citizens, and, and they trust uh, our use of their data so that we can continue leveraging this, this real important connection point between the individual and the, the city or the community um, or the, you know, the, the agency that's delivering this particular um, technology yeah i think yeah that i think that's where i would love to see us be in you know five to ten years five ten years I was, yeah. yeah and i was and i was also thinking you know it, it would be interesting to see if there are benefits to creating a grid of smart cities right and so you know going back to the maturity model if we're able to you know establish a framework where cities can work toward different sort of thresholds, um, stages of um, smart city capability, and we have um, a few of these cities in a region, then, you know, and they are all, all the similar, or they have gone through a similar stage of threshold, then what we're really doing is we're expanding that regional um, smart capability, where mm -hmm. it could offer not just the inhabitants of the cities, but the inhabitants of the uh, of the communities around the cities. And now what we're looking at is a real sort of confluence or achievement of a sustainable region or sustainable, you know, uh, a much larger geographic area than the city. Because as we are, <laughs> have recently experienced, unfortunately, uh, natural events, pandemics are not just focusing on or, or targeting a, uh, a city or a particular area it is global they are regional they are you know continental and that so i think we always have to sort of look at how we can expand the benefits of this te technology wider yep. and farther um leveraging a, a base such as a city to do that yep those were some interesting points and absolutely that makes a lot of sense so with that, we've come to the end of our episode. Thank you so much, Komnan, for taking all the time and being our guest today on Better Tech. Thank you so much, Amna. This was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.